Angela says, I don't get an introduction because you're supposed to know who I am. So I'm Catherine Gagne, and I'm, I'm delighted to be able to share with you today. I was a little bit nervous after Pastor Joel preached last week, and he said, you know, there are people that actually look to see who's preaching and then decide whether or not they're coming to church or not. So thank you. Thank you for being here. I want to open today with a quiz. And what I want you to do is simply put your hand up if you think you can answer the question. And don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to blurt out the answer. I just want an indication of how many people can do it. So, first question. How many of you can name the 10 wealthiest people in the world in descending order? I see no hands, no one looking around, all heads bowed, no one looking. <laughs> okay, sports buffs, you ready? How many of you can name the last five Heisman Trophy winners? Okay, women, how many of you know what the Heisman Trophy is? <laughs> okay, we got to do better. What about the Nobel Prize? And I'm going to give you the luxury of all six categories. How many of you can name the 10 people in the history of the Nobel Prize who have won the Nobel Prize, no matter what category? We got a hand. We got a hand. We got two hands. This is getting exciting. We're gaining momentum, people. Okay, I'll go real simple. Pop culture. How about the last six Academy Award winners and Best Actor and Best Actress? No. Okay. So we're, our batting average is really, really not that good. So I'm going to move on. You see, the point I'm trying to make is that nobody remembers the headliners of yesterday. Not one of the people I asked you to list was a second-rate achiever. They were the best in their field. But applause dies, trophies tarnish, and achievements are forgotten. But now let's see about this quiz. Show of hands. If you can name a couple of teachers that helped you in school. I see hands going up all over this place. Name three people who have taught you something worthwhile, a life lesson. List five people over the course of your life who have made you feel loved and appreciated. Okay, let's go up to six people. Name six people, new category, whose e just everyday people whose personal stories have inspired you. Can you name six people? You see, the people that make a difference in our lives are not the ones with the most credentials, the most money, or the most awards. They are the ones who care. They are the ones who have touched our lives in a deep and a meaningful way. Think about your life for a moment. How did you become the person you are today? Who influenced you? What role did other people play in making you who you are today? I am forever indebted and grateful for the lives of Dave and Linda Wells. They, they shaped who I am today. In this series on discipleship, I want us to examine the impact of discipleship. The plan of God for our life, if we're claiming Christ as Lord, is that we grow up in the teachings and the lifestyle of Jesus Christ and then give our life in service to his causes for the sake of his body. Ephesians 4, 14 to 15 says it's best, says it best. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth 
by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. That's the goal. Let's grow up, right? Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, all of us, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. We need to constantly grow up. Discipleship and being discipled isn't a one-time thing. It isn't a program. I believe being a disciple is a forever decision. Robert E. Coleman wrote, if, if making disciples is not the heartbeat of our life, something is wrong in our understanding of Christ and our willingness to walk in his way. For the call of God on each one of our lives begins with a call to discipleship, to love the Lord our God with all our strength, with all our minds, with all our soul, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Out of that place of love is a call to go and make disciples. I was once told that in order to be an effective disciple, and in making disciples, we need to be fat. <laughs> Not as in body, but as in the acronym. Faithful, available, and teachable. Fat. I think we live in a world where increasingly we're getting lost. As Ephesians 4 says, we are living in a world where people are getting tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by deceitful schemes. There is so much information coming at us that it's hard to discern truth and consequence. I think one of the reasons that it's imperative for us to be about being a disciple and making disciples I think about a book that I read many years ago that was written by a man called Walter Henriksen, and it's called Disciples Are Made, Not Born. We are to make disciples. Making something is deliberate. It is intentional. The most effective disciple-making occurs in genuine relationships which involves significant time together. Now, there may be some in this room that are saying, hey, I want to be discipled. And they may call up someone and say, hey, Glenn, will you disciple me? And that sometimes works. But the best way to be discipled, I feel, is just to come alongside to serve another person. And as you serve, you learn, you grow, you understand, you're exposed to all sorts of things. We never know when the most teachable moment is upon us. In our lives, I remember when Dean and I first became Christians. We phoned Doug and Di Christoffel. And it's important to note that we had an existing relationship with them and said, we've got questions. We don't know anything. We want to learn. So Doug and I sat with us every week and went through the Bible. We explored. We asked questions. We had deep discussions. We argued something because it was all new to us. And then we moved to Hong Kong and we were discipled by Pastor John McGovern who literally lived out the words of Christ when he said, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And we threw ourselves into the deep, deep waters of evangelism and saw many people come to know the Lord. John, as our pastor in Hong Kong, was radical. He would phone and he'd say, hey, what are you guys doing tonight? Nothing. Let's go, let's head out to the harbor and preach the gospel. And we would just head out and do it. There were zero programs in our church. It was all about, hey, let's just go out and preach the gospel. I remember when John asked us, 
well, actually, he didn't ask us. He told us to pioneer and pastor a church on an outlying island of Hong Kong. And remember, we were relatively new Christians. And we immediately phoned up Dave and said, help, help, what do we do? And Dave said, open up your home, open up your lives, and make disciples. He said, basically, Catherine and Dean, can you be hospitable? Just start with that. Just start with that. You see, these approaches to discipleship are important. To de- we need to deliver, develop, and deploy. All three of them are essential and desperately needed in this world because many things are becoming distorted. Life, I admit, can be really tough. And it's, be- it's absolutely imperative that we come alongside other people and see how they do it whether that be unpacking the word of God or heading out in the streets to pe- pre- preach <laughs> preach <laughs> or navigating the everyday issues of life you know what none of us feels prepared to go and make disciples none of us but think about it how much of our life have we ever been prepared for We're never. I didn't feel prepared to be a parent. I read many, many books prior to becoming a parent, and I never felt prepared. That was until I put it into practice that things became real. It was like faith without a corresponding work attached is dead. The same is true in my Christian life. I feel like I have been discipled and I am still being discipled and I have been faithful in making disciples, that being having people come alongside me and do life with me. We need to remember the disciples were not known for their intense, immense knowledge or the rituals they did, but rather they were known for having been with Jesus. You see, the concept of association, being with someone, was not a new idea that Jesus introduced. It played out many, many times throughout Scripture, where men were trained for the work of God by association with other people. Moses and Joshua, Elijah and Elisha, David and his mighty man. I was recently at an event with my daughter Isabel. And someone I really respect leans over to me and she says, you two could be sisters. Totally flattering to me. (laughs) Maybe not so much to my 25-year-old daughter. (laughs) But as I thought about it, The gravity of what she is saying sunk in. In fact, Isabel and I laughed about it, and she said, hey, Mom, what's it like to have the honor of raising a (laughs) mini-me? To be able to shape the life of another human being. To raise them to be the type of person you want. People, perhaps that's why we're called to a life of discipleship. Not to raise the kind of person I want, although it's nice, but rather, as Luke 6, verse 40 says, everyone, after he has been fully trained, will be like his teacher. Oh, Lord, may that teacher be Christ and not Catherine. But strangely enough, Christ uses Catherine. Or as a familiar poem says, I have searched the world over, in search of teachers true, and from the throngs that crowd life's lane, I have selected you. There are people in each one of our lives the Lord has put us in relationship with to disciple and to be discipled. As we grow in maturity, there needs to be a call that flows out of our lives. Just as it did with Paul. In 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, he says, Follow me 
as I follow Christ. But here's a reality we must all come face to face with. Every single one of us in this room is currently making disciples. There are people watching our lives. Some are deliberate and intentional, and others are purely observational. The question is, what type of disciple are we making? Are we leading people towards Christ? into a place of transformation, into the image of Christ. You see, D Jesus didn't die for a cause. He died for people. And that's why the call to make disciples is so important. I think for Dean and I, the pr our primary goal for the past 27 years has to been to make disciples of our three girls. Not to the exclusion of doing so with others, but as our primary intent. After all, our girls are the only humans on the planet placed in our lives by God himself. He entrusted them to us. And for the most part, especially if you saw a picture of my girls, Dean and I have made carbon copies. However, they all have their distinct personalities. All three of our girls went to Montreal to study at McGill University, which arguably is one of the most liberal universities in Canada. Were we worried that they would be influenced, that they would be changed, we knew that they would be challenged and much of what we had taught them would be brought into question. But we weren't afraid because we knew that they left knowing who they were in Christ. I remember our eldest daughter, Victoria's first day on campus. We laughed a somewhat nervous laugh and thought like the Wizard of Oz. Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> As she was handed a welcome bag that included a list of all the top bars and nightclubs in Montreal, instructions on what to do with alcohol poisoning, and a few condoms in the bag. All of this came smack in contrast to what Dean and I had raised our girls to be. You see, all of our girls went to Harvest City Christian Academy from kindergarten right through to grade 12. So out of the bubble, they burst forth. But I'm happy to report they all returned unscathed and came home fully determined to be who Christ has called them to be. When our eldest daughter, Victoria, finished her degree about five years ago, she felt God telling her to go and support the work of Pastor Brett Blair at King's Corner Church in Regina. You see, Pastor Brett had been her high school basketball coach for three years, and through that, he became a mentor to her, and he discipled her in many, many ways. And so when she said to Dean and I, I'm going to go and support Brett in his work, it just made sense. But I, and we knew that she could hit the ground running. We knew that she knew how to give. We knew that she knew how to serve. We knew that she knew how to preach. And basically, she knew how to grow, and she knew how to make disciples. I think that's our ultimate goal in discipleship, is to know with certainty that the person that we have discipled is now ready to go and make disciples, that they have enough to stand on their own and to multiply. Because living an abundant Christian life is not just about me and Jesus in my own little relationship bubble. It's about us getting spurred on out of a place of love for our Lord to go tell it on the mountains over at the hills and everywhere. There we go. At the end of this month, I have the very, very difficult task of taking our youngest daughter, Elizabeth, to France. 
to go to university. She's doing a semester of exchange in Lyon, France. With the state of our world, part of me gets very anxious about taking her and leaving her. And I know I did it once before when Isabel went and spent a semester studying in Budapest. I remember the day I flew home from Budapest thinking, what have I done? She doesn't speak Hungarian. She knows no one in this nation. She is all alone. But then my anxiety was replaced with a confidence. The same confidence I have in taking Elizabeth to France. No matter what happens, and none of us knows what the future holds, I know that I know that Elizabeth knows how to call on the name of the Lord. She knows who her strong tower is. Discipleship, discipling and becoming a disciple brings security in an uncertain world. But even more than that, it's the model that Christ set out for us. And that is what he charged us with. In Matthew 28, verse 19, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, surely, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus charged his 12 guys he had been with, his 12 disciples, to take the gospel to the world by making disciples. We see this same focus and urgency in Paul as he writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. And the things you have heard from me among many witnesses, the same commit them to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Commit them to fat men, faithful, available, teachable. Things you have heard from me indicates that importance of a personal relationship, of mutual trust and confidence, established by being together, working together, pulling in the same direction. The word commit in this portion of scripture submit, suggests a transmission from one person to another. When we invest in the lives of other people, we transmit not only what we know, but more importantly, what or who we are. Each of us becomes like the people that we associate with. Think about that for a moment. We become like the people we associate with. Who are you associating with? Who is discipling you? Basically, who is influencing you? Who are you discipling? Who are you influencing? Well-known author John Maxwell defines leadership as influence, nothing more, nothing less. That is why I say no matter what, whether by design or by default, we are making disciples. We are leading others. We are in many ways being discipled, but often it isn't in a disciplined or a decisive manner. The saying, more is caught than taught, seems to echo here. I once read a story about Ethiopia. In 1935, the Italians occupied Ethiopia. And during their period of occupation, they kicked out, they expelled all of the missionaries. And in Ethiopia, they, Ethiopia, it was reported that they left behind 60 believers in three churches. And one of the believers that they left behind was known as Suitcase Boy. Suitcase Boy. He was called Suitcase Boy because wherever the missionaries went, his job was just to carry their suitcases. And for the next seven years, the missionaries had no idea what was going on inside Ethiopia. And when they came back in 1942, they came back to 18,000 Christians in 155 different churches. Suitcase boy. 
said, oh my goodness, the missionaries are gone. So I will just do what they did. They had made a successful disciple. I knew from a young age as a Christian that I wanted to preach the gospel. And I didn't know how to do it. So I listened to every sermon that Dave Wells gave. I got the cassettes. I transcribed them word for word. And I stood in front of my mirror, delivering his messages and saying, God, rise up. Cause that to rise up within me. In some ways, even unbeknownst to Dave, I became a suitcase boy, (laughs) right? You see, our disciples reproduce. They replicate not only our strengths, but also our weaknesses. They take our perspectives and our convictions. It's sobering to pause and think about our lives right now. Do we want this to happen? Are we living a life worthy of the call that we have received? If not, today is the day to repent and change direction and get back on course. It's that easy. Say, Lord, I need you. We need to ask ourselves some sobering questions about where are we at in our relationship with the Lord? What will we reproduce in others? We can only reproduce in others what has first been developed in our own lives. We cannot give as an inheritance that which we don't already possess. One of Paul's letters to Timothy, he writes in 2 Timothy 3, 10 and 11. But you have fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, purpose, faith, suffering, charity, patience, and persecutions. Basically, you know all of me. You know all of my stuff. You have watched me live. There is a rawness to this statement. As we share our lives, as we make disciples... We don't just want to share the Kodak moments, the moments that we post on social media, the highlight reels. We share our lives, the good, the bad, and the ugly. However, we're called to model a life worth living. I remember one of my greatest parenting moments, not. We were getting, I was getting ready to drive the girls to school. I was in a mood. It was not a happy scene. I was not at my personal best. And through a little bit of demanding and a whole bunch of bossing them around and a bit of it being more about Catherine than about them, we got in the car and made our way. And the girls probably don't even remember this day, but I do, because I know God did something in the midst of my mess on that day. It is in the every day that details get worked out. You see, on that day, and trust me, there have been other days like it since, the girls saw me lose the plot. But then they saw me confess. They saw me ask for forgiveness and repent not justify. It didn't make my attitude right, but it established, it modeled something in my little disciples. You see, when Paul wrote Timothy, he was saying, this is what I committed to you. Not only my doctrine, not only my manner of life, not only my purpose and my faith, but you saw me be long-suffering. You saw me be charitable. You saw me be patient. My girls are still waiting for that one. But you witnessed my persecutions. The word commit stands out in this text in 2 Timothy. Commit suggests that transmission. 2 Timothy 2.2, the things you heard from me, commit them to faithful men who should teach them to others also. Commit them to faithful men, faithful women, faithful. Can we disciple someone who isn't faithful? Solomon made a statement and posed an interesting question in Proverbs 20 verse 6. He says, most men will proclaim to everyone his own goodness. But a faithful man, 
who can find? A faithful person is a person who has chosen eternal objectives for their life. And 2 Timothy 2.2 concludes with, teach others also. The imparting of life more is caught than taught is true, but we must also teach deliberately. Deuteronomy 6, 7, my husband loves this one. He repeats it all the time. He says, talk about them. Talk about them at home. Talk about them when you walk on the road. Tie them as symbols around your hand. Talk about them when you lie down. Talk about them when you get up. Write them on the doorposts of your life. You see, after Paul instructed Timothy to commit to faithful men the things that Timothy had learned from him, Paul goes on to say in verses 3 and 4, suffer hardship with me. As a good soldier of Christ Jesus, no soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Faithful men. Faithful women steadfastly resist being ensnared in the world's glittery attractions. And this is hard. This is hard because they sparkle so bright and they promise so much. But as scripture says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? The way of discipleship is from Christ to me, from me to you, from you to others. Replication and multiplication. Discipling and being discipled is the model the Lord set out for us. It not only brings confidence to our soul, but it establishes us in truth, when the storms and the winds come. Church, this is a good news message. If you are a person who's been serving the Lord a while and have weathered the storms of life and have instituted much of what I have talked to you about today, then you as a mature man or woman in Christ have something to offer the people just getting started. Young people, if you know the truth, you have something to offer other young people. Or maybe today you realize for the first time that you really desperately need to be discipled. If that's you, then either reach out to someone you know who is a mature Christian as identified in Ephesians 4, someone who's not tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, but rather those who are bold enough to speak the truth in love, who will help you grow in every respect. And if you don't know anyone like that, phone the church office, come talk to me after the service. Let's be a people who can teach, who can love, who are willing to make disciples. May we be found fat, faithful, available, teachable in Jesus' name. Now go and make disciples, confidently knowing that he has equipped you for every good work. Thank you. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. And we stand, Lord, saying, make us fat. Father, that we would be faithful, that we would be available, that we would be teachable. Lord, would you rearrange our lives? Would you search us and know us and reveal in us that which we need to turn and change and repent of? And Lord, may we set our eyes on you is on a, as a, on a flint. Father God, our desire is to be transformed into your image, trusting completely that you who began the good work is faithful to complete it in Jesus' name. Amen.